Okay, let me just uh, introduce our speaker today. So we're very happy that uh, Hendrik Lenstra will be giving uh, our uh, a course, Polynomial Time Algorithms in Algebraic Number Theory. And uh, Hendrik has made many wonderful contributions to the, the subject, the LLL algorithm, elliptic curve factorization, the Cohen-Lenstra heuristics. And he's also an excellent lecturer and, uh, uh, and he tells very good jokes. Oh, so, okay, so uh, please let's all uh, enjoy his lecture. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. It is a great pleasure and a great honor for me to have been asked to give a course on uh, algorithms in algebraic number theory. And the actual course is expected to actually only take place a year from now rather than a year ago. This week I will spend mostly on some preparations that will be useful to be used next year. And you may see already that I have been restricting my subject somewhat. I have added this prefix polynomial time because otherwise there is just too much to say. And if you restrict to polynomial time algorithms, I will tell you more about what they really are then you really cut out already a lot from the whole area. If you know any algebraic number theory at all, then you may know that some of the most mysterious objects in the area, they are class groups. Class group computations are very complicated and often also very non-rigorous. And we will only very superficially touch upon them. It is mostly cut out when you restrict to polynomial time. And it is good to know that there is another restriction I will make. I will talk about the theory rather than about the algorithm. So I will not teach a course on how to use software packages that do computations in algebraic number theory. I will talk not about pressing buttons, but I will talk about what is below the buttons, the mathematics behind it. And I will concentrate on actually proven theorems concerning the performance and the efficiency of algorithms in algebraic number theory. Let me just be uh, clear about what I intend to do this week. Today, I just want to uh, give a brief introduction on the sort of things that I will concentrate upon in these lectures. Then on Tuesday, I will start explaining some auxiliary algorithms. And the first one to be considered is actually the LLL algorithm that was just mentioned in the much appreciated introduction I just received. On Thursday, I will talk about algorithms for finitely generated abelian groups. There are lots of finitely generated abelian groups that you encounter in algebraic number theory, such as the additive groups of the rings and the ideals and the residue class rings that we encounter. And it is good to know how one deals with those objects. And Friday night, if we are still alive, by then late in the evening here in Europe, I will give an actual algorithm in algebraic number theory that uses much of what I will have been talking about in the earlier part of the week. In between, there are also problem sessions, and uh, they, those are run by my uh, teaching assistant, Dan van Gent, maybe. Dan, you should uh, make yourself visible to the camera. This is Dan, and you will get to see more of Dan for the rest of the week. He has been helping me a lot uh, by writing the notes and by controlling all these uh, electronics and I suppose that he will be just as useful to you. So let me then first mention some of the basics. We are going to do mathematics rather than computer science so most of the objects we will treat our actual theorems and it is good to know that the word algorithm does have a rigorous meaning 
you can borrow that from any book on theoretical computer science. It is good enough for us to just define an algorithm as a Turing machine, it, and it is not really necessary to know the precise definition of those. It is reassuring to know that such a definition exists, but we will not really use it. We will just depend on your intuitive understanding of what an algorithm is and what the number of steps that is executed by an algorithm upon a certain input, how that is defined and that can be defined that can be made precise using Turing machines. But rather than computer science, we want to be doing number theory and algebra. And what we will in particular consider, I mentioned already the class groups in algebraic number theory, but you will agree with me that one of the main purposes of algebraic number theory is to control the multiplicative structure, the ideal theory in algebraic number fields. And that is what I will concentrate upon in these lectures, mostly maybe uh, next year. So in order to illustrate this type of question, I would like to start with the easiest um, number field of all, which is the field of rational numbers in this case. Uh, yeah, the multiplicative structure of the field of rational numbers is well controlled through uh, unique prime factorization. But when you view unique prime factorization from the angle of algorithms, then you run already into a serious problem because there is not any known polynomial type algorithm that, given an integer, will factor it for you into prime numbers. And that gives rise to the following theorem not being completely obvious. And I want to treat this in some detail, the theorem that I'm about to formulate, because it illustrates several points. And it is a theorem that looks very easy, and it is, in fact, too deep. But let me first formulate it. So there is, uh, yeah, let me just call it PTA. PTA, that means a polynomial time algorithm, and all my algorithms will be deterministic. So I will not uh, add this prefix. Probabilistic algorithms are certainly of exceeding importance, especially in practical situations. But uh, deterministic algorithms, that is what you really want to be after in pure mathematics, having a deterministic algorithm for something, a polynomial time algorithm is, so to speak, next best to simply having a formula for it. There is a polynomial time algorithm. And what does it do? That, well, it receives a certain input. And the input is a sequence of non-zero uh, rationals. So the length of the sequence is a number t. And these numbers are represented typically in binary. And then there is a sequence of t non-zero rational numbers. And these rational numbers, you may specify them by a sign as well as a numerator and a denominator. And then we have some exponents and one through and t, another sequence, and they are integers. And this is the input. And the output is a single bit. It decides whether or not this power product, the product from 1 to t of qi to the ni is equal to 1. So that is a theorem that I want to explain to you in order to illustrate what the sort of difficulties are that you encounter when you want to design polynomial time algorithms in number theory. And then one of our purposes will be to have a similar theorem, not just for the rational numbers, but also for finite extensions of them. 
And that is, as it turns out, quite a bit of work. And I think it is not far from the truth that a theorem like this, or algebraic number fields, is about the hardest problem for which a polynomial time algorithm actually is known to exist in algebraic number theory. So this is the problem, of course, you can, uh, you can rephrase it a bit. So the first thing that you do is that you check whether this number is positive, that is too easy to merit much comment at this point. So let me forego this and assume that at least the sign is what it should be. And then you can write the QI as a numerator divided by a denominator, both of them being positive. And if I call those AI, then the question is whether the product of the AI is equal to the same product of the BI, the BI being the denominators. So here, all these AI and BI, they are, uh, they are positive integers, the ni they may still be negative, but you can shuffle a little bit and make them positive and then maybe you get different exponents. Let me write an mi here and the question is how do I decide whether two power products of positive integers are equal to each other. And uh, let me just tell you a few possible approaches to the proof of this theorem, in other words, to a description of an algorithm that would do such a thing. And the first is so from method one compute simply by ordinary arithmetic both of these integers compute the left hand side and the right hand side just explicitly in, in binary and then you can easily tell whether these things are equal but there is one big problem and that is this word polynomial time because polynomial time that means that the number of steps that you are allowed to spend in your algorithm should be no more than a constant power of the total length of the input and constant power that means that that constant should not be dependent upon the input to your algorithm it should be the same constant for all different inputs and the length of the input will be counted in bits so if you write down the ai and the ni and the bi and the mi then uh, you just have to take essentially the logarithms to the base two and if you add it up over all of these numbers then a uh, certain power of it uh, is the number of time the, the amount of time that you are allowed to spend and if you compute a number like this explicitly for example if you look at if, if one of these a's is equal to two and some number of these uh, these exponents is very low it's called it capital n then just writing down this output or maybe in binary let's just replace it by 13 13 to the power n if you write it down in binary then the number of binary digits will be approximately linear in n so you are not able to write down that number let alone compute this so this method is certainly valid and correct but it is not polynomial time because the numbers that you encounter are too large it is actually possible to compute this number with a polynomial number of operations because you can by quickly you can quickly reach this exponent n uh, by uh, by not just doing multiplications but also squarings once in a while but the problem is of course that all these intermediate numbers are, are too large and that is actually one of the uh, main problems that we will have to battle in 
in obtaining algorithms, also in algebraic number theory, that you have a certain obvious idea, but the numbers that it leads to are simply out of control. That is something, for example, a question that you have to consider also when you want to compute uh, determinants of matrices. In that case, there is fortunately a good solution, but with these high powers, there is nothing that you can really that can really be safe. So that is method one. Method one, it is not fast, but it does have another, uh, it does have an advantage, which I do not know how to do in polynomial time. And that is, if the numbers are different, the method will also tell you which of the two is larger. And deciding which of the two is larger, uh, I do not know whether that can be done in polynomial time. So there you see one of the problems that you encounter and that we will have to fight. The other problem I already mentioned, and that is method two, that is you compute the prime factorization. Because two numbers are equal, if and only if their prime factorizations are equal. And there you see that we run into a complementary problem. It is not the NIs that are bothering you, because once you have the prime factorization of the bases, the A's and the B's, then you can easily compute the prime factorization of the power product. But the problem is that if this AI is not like the number 13 that I just wrote down, but itself a sizable number, then nobody knows how you can find the prime factorization of the A's and the B's in polynomial time. And that is one of the other major problems that we will also encounter in our algorithms, namely prime factorization and localization techniques in general are very much exploited in the theory of uh, algebraic numbers and the proof of the theorems. But if you want to design your algorithms simply by mimicking the proofs in algebraic number theory, which are quite often constructive enough, then you will run into a problem when you want to factor your algebraic numbers into prime ideas. And that is mostly due, well, maybe I would say it is exclusively due to the fact that you cannot do it over the integers itself. Once you can have a good algorithm for Z, it would not be difficult to transpose it to algebraic numbers as well. So here you see two non-proofs of the theorem. And the way the theorem is actually correctly proved is that you go for a, what you would call a partial factorization of the AI and the BI. And that is something that is known as the co-prime base algorithm, which I want to tell you something about. The co-prime base algorithm that is an algorithm that has the following properties. It has as input. Well, let me take for convenience just positive integers. So again, it is a finite sequence of length t. And let's say that I just take a1 through a t. You can make it twice as long for this application with the b's. So those are uh, positive integers. And the output that is another number, let's call it u, also a non-negative integer, and a set of integers q1, q, u. And I choose the notation q for them, which is not quite like p. Because, well, if I had called them P, you might think that they are prime numbers, but these numbers, they are in a sense 
almost prime, they are prime enough for our purposes. And being prime enough for our purposes, that means, first of all, that they have a chance of being prime, they are bigger than one, and they are pairwise co prime, another good property of prime numbers. So, pairwise co prime, that means that if I take any two indices i and j, and i is different from j, then qi and qj have gcd equal to one. And then there is also a matrix of integers, non-negative integers, that is for i from 1 to t and for j from 1 to u. And that is the third property. They are prime enough for our purposes, and our purposes are to factor those ai in terms of our mock prime number. So for each i from 1 to t, ai is the product over j of qj to the power n i j. So that is the co prime base algorithm. Uh, it says compute, but that really should be co prime. And the claim is that such an algorithm exists and can be designed to be uh, polynomial time. And since this is for our purposes quite an important algorithm, I would like to explain the basic idea of how you accomplish this. And I should mention that if you want to know more about this, then you should look at a paper by Dan Bernstein, which is doubtless mentioned in the notes that Dan has been composing and that it should be available to you. Those notes, by the way, uh, they are not uh, conjectured to be perfect. So if you see anything in there that can be improved, be sure to let Dan or myself know so that you will have some better notes for later in the week and for next year. So what Dan, Dan Bernstein uh, has been doing, he is a mathematician who is mostly active in cryptography, is that he came up with a version of this co-prime phase algorithm that is not only a polynomial time, but that is almost linear in the sense that the time spent on the algorithm, maybe not on a Turing machine, but on a somewhat more advanced machine model, is not much higher than linear in the length of the input. So if you add up the logarithms of the AI and you raise it to the power one plus epsilon, then you get an approximation for the time that is spent on the algorithm. And there will be versions of this algorithm that I may mention later in my lecture that are of in crucial importance in algebraic normal theory. And in that case, the AI will either be elements of uh, algebraic number fields, integers, maybe algebraic integers, or even ideals. And then the Qs will also not be numbers, but ideals, so to speak, the mock prime ideals. So you will see from the algorithm that uh, it allows quite some uh, uh, generalization to other situations. And to, uh, to illustrate the algorithm, I will restrict to a special case. And that is the case t equal 2. And what is interesting about the case of t equal 2, just two numbers, is that nevertheless 
the U can be quite low. I think that there is an exercise in the notes that shows that uh, that if the, if you have two numbers a and b, a one and a two, that uh, if you make them large enough, then the u can also tend to infinity. And it is also a question posed in one of those problems to see how fast the u can tend to infinity as a function of a one and a two. But let me just stick to table two because that suffices to give the idea. And what is important about the case uh, about this algorithm that you should know that is that if you have two numbers a and b, two positive integers, let's say, then first of all, the greatest common divisor can be computed. That is, so that is the greatest common divisor of a and b. And of course, one way of expressing the greatest common divisor is by using the prime factorization of a and b, but that one is not accessible to us. So instead, you use what people call the Euclidean algorithm, which dates to about 300 BC, and it proceeds by the Euclidean algorithm by some inductive procedure, replacing A by its remainder upon division by B, and repeating that until that remainder becomes zero, in which case the previous number that you computed is GCD. And if this GCD is equal to uh, D, then you see that the GCD of A divided by D and B divided by D is equal to D divided by D, which is 1. And co-prime numbers, that is of course what we want in this algorithm, because if the A and I are co-prime to begin with, then uh, all you do here is, well, then the QI can be taken equal to the AI, and your matrix of exponents will simply be the identity matrix. Okay, so this is the basic mathematics that goes into the algorithm, and let me illustrate the algorithm by taking the number A equal to the number 4,000. 500, and that is A, and B, that is 5,400. And these are the A and the B. And here I write my input numbers again. They will stay there. The rest will be subjected to the forces of my eraser. But I will write these numbers as multiplicative combinations for the numbers in the top row. And this number, 4,500, is the first power of this number times the zeroth power of the other one. Now you have, again, the identity matrix. And then what you do is that you test whether your numbers are co-prime by the Euclidean algorithm. And because if they are co-prime, you're done. But the Euclidean algorithm tells you, well, if I subtract this number from that number, I find 900, which happens to divide that number. So 900, that is the GCD of 4,500 and 5,400. And there is one thing that I should have mentioned, namely, before you compute this GCD, you draw a line here. And the lines in my algorithm, they indicate, they always connect numbers that we do not yet know to be co-prime. But once we compute this number 900, and just like here, we remove it from the input numbers. So the 900, if I divide it away from the 5, from the 4,500, I find a 5, and here I find 5,400 divided by 900 is a 6. And then my original 4,500 will be the product of 5 and 900. So I get also a column vector here, which is the sum of the vectors of the numbers that I computed the GCD of. So you see 5,400 is 5 to the power 0, 
times 900 to the power of 1 times 6 to the power of 1. And you see that there is no theorem in the world saying that these numbers are called prime. So I connect them with the line. And likewise, there is a line here, but the original line connecting the 5 and the 6, that one has disappeared because by this theorem, 4,500 divided by 900, the 5 and the 6, they are co-prime, so I don't need to compute the GCD again. So that is the first stage. And now you proceed as before with each line that you see. So the GCD of 5 and 900, I can compute by heart. That is 5. And that 5, I should divide away from the input two numbers, the, the 5 becomes a 1, and the 900 divided by 5. Well, I think that I don't need a dance computer for this. This is just 180. And then I add up my two vectors, 1, 0, and 1, 1. That gives me 2 and 1. Okay, so that was one step. And then I see to my pleasure that one of the numbers in the top row has become a 1. And a 1 in the top row is of no use to me. I can forget about it. And also when it is connected to other numbers, I simply erase the connection. So just to be sure, you can now check that uh, 4,500 is 5 squared times 180 times 6 to the power 0, which it is, and likewise for the bottom row. And then, well, we have a choice. Let's first do this one. 6 is also a number of, uh, divisor of 180. So I can divide it out. There is a 30, that is, there is a 6, that is the GCD. And I divide it away from these numbers, a 30 and a 1. And then I add the two vectors that are the neighbors, that is a 1 and a 2. And also here, do we have a 1 and a 0 that I can erase? And now you, again, do the same thing. You put a 5 here. You divide it away from the 5 and the 30. You add up the neighbors. And you erase the 1. And the same thing happens over here. It is a pretty symmetric situation, actually. So this GCD is a 6. It gives you a 1. And it gives you a 1 here, a 2, and a 3. And if I did not make any errors, you see that if I erase the ones, also all the connecting lines are gone. And we find that the output is Q1 is 5, and Q2 is 6. And the matrix of exponents is the matrix that is still on the blackboard. OK, so this is just an indication. In this case, you get only two numbers out of it. You will see in the notes that all this can be generalized to more numbers. So that means that you have a whole graph. And you have and so the, the, the vertices of the graph, there are two of them. They are labeled with the A's. And you connect two vertices, uh, any two of them. So we have a complete graph because you don't know any of those numbers to be called prime. And then, uh, then you have an edge in the graph. You compute the corresponding GCD. And then you have certain rules for which you can erase parts of the graph. And at the end, you find the, uh, the output. And I don't like to do this graph theoretic exercise on the blackboard. So I, uh, uh, I would like to keep that as something that you can 
figure out on your own, of course, that will also be of interest in the sense that you have to provide this algorithm with a complexity analysis, you have to give an upper bound for the runtime. And I gave here a simplified uh, version of the algorithm. I mentioned that Dan Bernstein has been giving an almost linear algorithm. The version that I gave here is not almost linear, that you will see, for example, if your input is the number two and a very high power of two, then you will see that you lose only one two at a time and that takes forever. So then Bernstein has some additional moves that you can do in the game that speed it up in case you would otherwise encounter high powers. Okay, well, if you have this algorithm, then it is sort of clear that if you go back to our original question of recognizing whether two power products are the same, that you can provide it with a polynomial time algorithm, namely you take as your input, well, you remove the A's and the B's that are equal to one, and then you look at the A's and the B's together, you compute the Q's that factor all the A's and the B's, and then you have to use the fact that if you have these pairwise co-prime integers greater than one, then they are multiplicatively speaking independent. Such a power product can only be one if all the exponents are zero. So in other words, if you look at the factorization of this product that you have obtained and the one that you get out of this product, so that is something that you get by essentially multiplying some of these matrices with these column vectors of, of uh, exponents, then if the, if the outcome gives you the same column vector, then your numbers are equal and otherwise they are different. And in the latter case, it may be very difficult and time consuming to decide whether uh, uh, which of the two is actually larger. Now, this largeness is not so much a concern of us since uh, we are in our algebraic number theory question. These numbers fields have typically you no know, canonical ordering, and even if they have, uh, they, uh, they will not be uh, coming up in our algorithms. So this is a solution to a basic problem in multiplicative number theory for which you have an efficient algorithm available. And let me formulate a theorem that I expect to be able to present or at least outline the proof of uh, next year. And that is the following theorem. And that is a little more advanced than the previous one. So there is and if I say that there is an algorithm, then in practice, this always means not just that I have shown that some abstract algorithm space is all empty, but I actually know the algorithm. And the proof that I give of the existence is perfectly constructive. So there is a, a polynomial time algorithm. And the input is an algebraic number field which i will call capital k and that already suggests the question how you represent a number field with a finite number of bits in such a manner that you can presented to an algorithm. That is certainly one of the issues that we will have to deal with. And in the case of algebraic number fields, the answer is uh, pretty straightforward. What you may think of is that you just write down a defining polynomial for an element that 
generate scale. Maybe not the most elegant way of doing it, but it is certainly good enough and basically equivalent to other more or less obvious way, ways of specifying an algebraic number field. You just have to essentially, if you have a basis for K as a vector space over the rationals, you want to write down the product of any two basic elements expressed on that same basis. So that is only the first part of the input. And the field should be presented to you in such a manner that you also have a presentation for the, uh, for the elements of K. In the example that I mentioned, it will simply be vectors over the rations. And then I have, as before, the non negative integer T, and I input also some elements of K to celebrate the fact that they are not just rationals, but algebraic numbers. I use Greek letters for them, alpha one through alpha t, and they are sitting in K star. And this is like what I did for the rationals, except, but then for the rationals, I also had exponents, and I am now looking at a somewhat more advanced theorem in which those exponents are eliminated. And I and as follows. So, um, so what is it? This is the input, and it computes the kernel of a certain group homomorphism. And what is that? Well, you take z to the t, the free group, the free abelian group on t generators, one generator for each of my alphas. And I map this additive group to the multiplicative group of K by sending the ith basis vector to the ith element in my sequence, the alpha i. So this goes, this is defined by sending a vector of integers to the corresponding power product of the alphas. And that is clearly a group homomorphism, a group homomorphism from an additive group to a group that is written in a multiplicative manner. And uh, in interesting cases, this kernel will be infinite. So then the question is, as before with my k, the question is, how do you actually compute kernels? And that is something that I will need to address later this week, how do you in general specify and do computations with finitely generated abelian groups? And these specifications, they depend on theorems. So in this case, there is a theorem that if you have a subgroup of z to the t, like this kernel, then it will itself be z to the power something. So it will be freely generated by a finite number of vectors, no more than t, actually. So if I say compute the kernel, then what I mean is that you first of all compute the rank of the kernel, what it is isomorphic to, z to the u for some u. And then you also need u vectors that form a basis for the kernel. And this is what the theorem does for you. So such an such a vector ni that is in the kernel, you can think of as a relation between the alpha i, a multiplicative relation. You have an element in the kernel, an element will be in the kernel, such a vector, even only if this power product is equal to one. So here we are not deciding whether a given vector is a relation, but we are deciding upon all of them at the same time. So if you want to know whether a particular element of z to the t is a relation, then that comes down to deciding whether that element can be expressed on the basis for the kernel that comes out of this algorithm. So there you see the way in which computations with finally generated median groups will be needed. So this is a theorem that is uh, quite a bit stronger than the previous one that I formulated, first of all, of course, 
because I allow arbitrary algebraic number fields. And secondly, because I compute all relations between them rather than wondering about one particular would be relation. And let me spend the last two minutes with writing down another theorem. So this is a theorem that can be thought of as an, one of the analogs of the co prime base algorithm. There is a polynomial prime algorithm with the same input. And output. Uh, well, what is the output? Well, first of all, an order in the number field. R in K, an order. And an order in the number field is by definition a uh, suffering of the ring of integers of K, let's say of finite index. The ring of integers of K, that is a very difficult object to compute under the rules of the game that I mentioned in polynomial prime. With orders, you can also work with. And then we have our mock prime ideals, a sequence. Let's call them Q1 through Q2, with U at least zero in integer of ideals that are the proper ideals of R, the previous Qs were bigger than one, these are not equal to R, and they are pairwise co prime. So for all i different from j, you want that Qi plus Qj is equal to the whole ring. And then you have also uh, integers nij, i is one to t and j is 1 to u, such that for all i, if you look at the principal ideal generated by my alpha i, it is a product of, oh, I forgot the word here, these ideals, they should be invertible. And that is because I want to be able to allow arbitrary exponents from the integers in this power product. In particular, also negative integers, I want to be able to work with invertible ideas. And this is a lot of work. It can be done in polynomial time. And it is actually a quite lovely algorithm. And I hope to be able to say much more about it, probably not this week, but next year. Okay, I thank you for your attention. Okay, let's all thank uh, Hendrik for that very nice lecture. Okay. Okay. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and uh, do, do we have, uh, we've had, I know we've had some discussion in the chat. Do we, uh, are there any uh, questions for Hendrik now? Yeah, so I don't know whether I can hear them, but Jan will be able to tell me what they are. So if you have questions, please just unmute yourself now and ask. And don't feel free if uh, questions come up with you later to mail them to us and uh, you can always uh, answer them, maybe even on some public chat room. I don't know how that works. Dan does. Uh, so, uh, hello? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. So in the last theorem that you, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yes. So in the last theorem, uh, why do you need orders? I didn't, I didn't see that. Uh, well, I want to talk about ideals, and ideals uh, in fields are not so interesting, and the field has only two ideals. So uh, before I can talk about ideals, I, I need a ring. So does it answer your question? Uh, so you, you could have taken the uh, ring of integers also, right? No, 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 no. I cannot take the ring of integers because that is not part of the input, and there is no known algorithm to compute it in terms of the input. In time. Okay, okay. I see. So that Thanks. is the problem.
understand. That is a okay. very good question. That is an essential point. Thank you. Thanks. Maybe there is one thing that I should mention. Now that you ask about this, if I take any subring of K, then this ideal generated by alpha i, it will be a principal ideal, and therefore it will also be uh, invertible. And uh, if you have these co prime ideals with this property, then something much stronger is true. Maybe if I take any subset whatsoever of these alphas, let's say a non empty subset, then the ideal they generate together, so the sum of the R alpha i, where i ranges over that subset, will also be invertible. And that is a property that is not true. The sum of two invertible ideals need, does not need to be invertible. And that is a good reason to wish that you could take for R the ring of integers, because for the ring of integers, every non zero ideal is invertible. So, what you are saying is actually one of the difficulties of this algorithm. If you discover in the process of this algorithm a non invertible ideal, then you are forced to change your ring. Great stuff. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, let's thank uh, Hendrik one more time. Okay, thank you, thank you, it was a great day.